My name is Stephen Mullen. I work in uh, the Peds Emergency Department in Boston. I have the privilege of opening up today's session on Peds Emergency, talking about what probably is the most exciting topic on the list, paediatric trauma. We're going to cover some of the base principles surrounding the paediatric trauma, and then we'll go on to a case discussion of a, a more relevant and just look at some of the literature behind that. So the first question is, can I treat a paediatric trauma patient the same as an adult trauma patient? Now, the answers are yes and no start off pretty simple and just to add a little bit of substance that um dr roman has kindly agreed to do 20 burpees for every question that is answered correctly and there's six questions so it could be a great start um so let's uh see what the answers are so you got um 65 percent that said no you're mentally even to suggest this and 35 said yeah that's a kind of what i was hoping for the, a lot of the information that we have from pediatric trauma actually derives from adult studies. So contrary to most other pediatric teaching for trauma, um, we are able to apply adult principles onto the pediatric trauma patient. Pediatric trauma is rare as is severe trauma. So therefore we can use the uh, adult information. Now there is some slight difference to our trauma ABC algorithm. Um, whenever we, we have got catastrophic hemorrhage which sits at the top of this. And this is simply put, if you don't stop the bleeding, you won't have an airway to fix. And for every line that we come across, we have an adjunct that we need to consider doing. So for airway, we're thinking early about C-spine control. For breathing, we're thinking, do we need to do any form of ventilatory support for circulation? I want to stop the hemorrhage to try and prevent further bleeding. I think of disability and want to prevent secondary insults both to the brain and the spinal cord and to perfuse those end organs. And then for exposure, I'm looking at everywhere else, thinking about my secondary survey and also temperature, which we know is part of the lethal triad of trauma. And anyone who works in an emergency department or certainly mine will see a kid that comes in routinely hypothermic, either because it's absolutely freezing in Ireland all the time, or it's the consequence of being transported in an ambulance that is cold um, or via air. There is some variations that we do need to consider. So we do not uh, participate in balanced resuscitation or permissive hypertension. And I would not do this for pediatric or adolescent patients. A paper we'll talk about in a few slides that showed that there's a tenfold increase for hypotension in the trauma patient. So just don't practice it. If you've got someone who's hypertensive, hypotensive, they're essentially circling the drain from pediatrics. And I would try to resuscitate them back up to normal tension. We are much more conservative in our approach to imaging and also surgery. So any visceral injuries, the majority of our surgeons will observe. And as with all pediatric work, everything is weight based. So you can't treat a one kilo child the same as a hundred kilo, which I'm sure we could all recommend or some other uh, mem memoirs to help and try and get through it. So question two, what percentage of pediatric trauma cases are polytrauma? And we've got uh, answers one to five, which varies between 1% and 38%. Uh, we have about 30 seconds again to answer this. And when we talk about polytrauma, we're talking about more than two body systems injured. And this is as per TARN data. So TARN is the Trauma Audit Research Network, and it collates data from the UK and Ireland with pre-specified criteria. So it's not every single trauma case. It's one that has specific inclusion criteria. So the majority in the chat are saying 7%. Oh, that is uh, interesting, Dr. Roman, because that would be the correct answer. This graphically uh, would say that polytrauma is 7%. And this is really important for how we manage our trauma patients coming through. This compares to the adult data, which would be between anywhere in 20 and 40%. And particularly when you go up to those silver trauma cases, where from a simple mechanism, you can have multiple body injuries. Um, in pediatrics, this isn't the case. And... This is a justification for our conservative approach to imaging. And this was a lovely paper that was published in JAMA, which had 43,000 participants. So that's what we would see here versus a selective approach. And they found no difference in them through. You will have cases that in the depths of your stomach, you will think, I want to do further deviates from our recommendations. And what I would speak to a senior, and in some instances, your PAN scan or whole body CTs are entirely appropriate. But in pediatrics, you need to justify it as a CT head, neck, chest, abdo, and pelvis will usually for my center. So question three, what proportion of severe trauma cases are a result of non-accidental injury or suspected physical abuse? Majority is 9%, or, or sorry, hang on, sorry, 
Oh, I like the way we've got a very captive, educated audience because that's exactly what the figure would show. If you look over at the fourth um, bar chart, you'll see suspected physical abuse under two years of age, and it sits at 13%. So of all trauma data recorded in the UK and Ireland, 13%, I think that's a huge number of cases. And if we look at this graphically, looking at it by age, you can see for those aged under one, half of all cases have been injured by usually a caregiver or parent, which drops to 25% between the age of one and two, which is still massive numbers. And part of the difficulty I have is when I teach in courses, a lot of the scenarios are built on Jimmy fell off a bicycle, road traffic accident, or fallen off a car. But the most severely injured kids are just some images that I was able to get off um, local websites over the last year of children who have fallen victim to murder or severe injury. These cases are really difficult to pick up. And this is one locally for us of an uh, image taken from a recess room of a parent coming in, resuscitating their critically unwell child. The child is taken in, resuscitated. The parent is consoled and uh, told everything will be all right. And it's only two or three days later that you realize that the perpetrator or the one who actually killed the child was the one who came running into it. And this can be really difficult for a department to deal with. And this principle of double jeopardy for all um, pediatric safeguarding is really important. Now, what this means is that we send the patient home to an area where there's physical abuse or suspected physical abuse, and they're at increased risk of all cause mortality. And that's why in pediatrics and for emergency medicine and primary care, we're all taught for every case that comes through, you need to think, is this potentially NAI or suspected physical abuse? So we're going to move on to our clinical case. And the case that we have is based in a district general hospital or a level two trauma center. So you get a pre-alert and a patient will arrive with you in approximately five minutes. There's been a stabbing. The major trauma center is 30 minutes away um, and they've lost output. So they're redirecting to yourselves. And these are really, really difficult cases think about and sometimes it can be very much a case of cognitive overload you're thinking about how am i going to manage this what am i going to do you're thinking about pathways parameters is in which you can simplify this down in order to deal with the case that's in front of you to maximize the potential outcome for this patient for me i'm thinking about people place and products so what people do i need to bring in to my resuscitation room and what people do i need to ensure are out to make sure the rest of the apartment is run safe and that those ones who don't need to be seen can be re redirected somewhere else i'm thinking of the place so how is my resource room going to be cleared do i need to clear corridors um, and products not only for blood products for this case but what machinery or what pieces of equipment do i specifically need to bring in and you can kind of find if you have some train of thought that this will help direct you um to to help the patient essentially so the next question uh, for cardiac arrest in terms of the algorithm for resuscitation does it differ for trauma or does it remain the same yeah so it's fairly clearly different for trauma about 60 to 60 percent to 40 percent of the difference um so again another uh, 20 properties for dr roman so that is very much the case a lot of this is based on a delphi study that came from vasalo et al um who looked at emergency practitioners, anesthetics, ICU consultants to decide how we best resuscitate these children. What they have decided is to come up with a caregiving bundle or bundle of life seven interventions. And for this, we're there to control hemorrhage, consider pelvic binder, bilateral thoracostomies, making sure we oxygen and ventilate the patient and try and get blood products in on place. So the patient arrives into the emergency department um, and in terms of resuscitation, we practice this horizontal approach. So you're not assessing A, then B, then C, but A, B, C, and D are all being assessed at the same time and the information fed back to the trauma team leader. Patient arrives in your department, you confirm cardiac arrest, you find that there's no external uh, bleeding, and the trainee, who's from ED, asks, can we stop chest compressions? So for the next question is yes or no answer. So what's the, the verdict, Chris? It's a pretty even split, Stephen. Uh, yes, 55%, no 45 Again, the majority of the audience are uh, getting these all right. And this answer is derived from a paper not based on three little pigs, but actually 39 little pigs. 
um, from a study that occurred in England where each of the 39 albums were randomized into different groups and were allowed to have a massive um, hemorrhage as well as traumatic cardiac arrest. And it was comparing chest compressions to whole blood to saline. And the group that done best was the one that was given whole blood. And it didn't really matter whether they were given closed chest compressions or not. The ones that done worst and the only one where had the all the pigs died was in closed chest compressions only. And what this has led us to is to deprioritize chest compressions in our initial resuscitation. When we want the patient intubated, potentially access, blood going through, a pelvic binder, you've got lots of equipment, very, very busy resource room, and you want that done certainly within two to three minutes. So while that's occurring, what people will recommend is that you can stop chest compressions and once everything's been stabilized, you can go back on the chest. And this is really difficult for us in pediatrics and it brings a completely different feel to your resuscitation room. But if you're in resource with traumatic cardiac arrest and somebody says stop chest compressions while we initiate this life given or saving bundle, then that's absolutely appropriate. So we're going to move on um, and we're going to say that the patient arrived in your emergency department within two to three minutes and down for two minutes beforehand and you have done your full station as what has been lost and the question arrives would you perform a clamshell thoracotomy yeah so you've got a very clear yes uh, this is fantastic because i think probably five years ago we would have got a very different set of answers and we look at this algorithm again from basalo et al it clearly says consider emergency department thoracotomy within 10 minutes of um loss of output and penetrating trauma now especially penetrating trauma it does say consider in blunt as well but if you look at the data from uk wise Vasala as well as doing the delphi study also looked at traumatic cardiac arrest coming from the torrent database and they found a 30-day survival of 5.4 percent with only seven um over i think about an 18 year period so quite low numbers and um, we look at the adult data it's probably closer to 10 percent so we ex Look at this paper in terms of procedures performed. So those who had resuscitated thoracotomy, there was 18 over this period and zero patients survived. The only thing that did make a difference was if the patient was sent to a major trauma center um, where the outcome was improved, supporting the use of the major trauma network. If we extend this to look at some other papers, so this is a systematic review out of Australian group, seven papers. Now they excluded penetrating trauma and also road traffic accidents. Um, and they found the overall survival was 1.2% of traumatic cardiac arrest. This increased to 26 whenever they removed those who were deemed at um, were just poor quality studies or low numbers. And a further analysis looking at those who were transported from scene, so those who got some sort of intervention and were deemed well enough to go to hospital, their survival figures increased to 9.4%, which is very close to what we'd see for adults. So what about emergency department thoracotomy? Now, this is a journal published in Pediatric Surgery in 2018, and this is just a review um, of the published data, not necessarily a systematic review. Again, it shows you that blunt is really poor outcome at 1.7%, very similar to adults, which is about 1.4, 1.5. For penetrating trauma, they have a percentage of about 14. Now, if you look at the data a little bit more closely, I think it's probably closer to 10% on how they've added it up, but it's still 10% of pediatric patients um, who had uh, emergency department thoracotomy survived, which is, is the exact same as the data in the adult side and not unreasonable. And what's probably changed our thought process is some of the information that came out from the Manchester arena where a patient who had a traumatic cardiac arrest in the emergency department didn't have a clamshell thoracotomy performed with some criticism coming from some of the expert witnesses. Now, the two people who made the decision were a senior consultant in ED and a pediatric surgeon, and they were able to justify their decision based on the evidence and say that it clearly wasn't indicated. But for me, what this would mean is if you had a case where the indications were met, then it might be that you're facing the same sort of backlash either from the media or the parents. And in this case, um, I remember this an interview with the parents where they felt the child her, their child could have potentially survived if she had had this performed which is not what um we want our parents leaving our departments thinking about it's really important to try and keep these uh, interventions as simple as you can if you try and overload yourself whenever the patient arrives in your department it's simply just not going to occur so try and keep it simple for us this means us practicing and we've used uh, low cost high fatality using uh, animal models and these were all little pigs that ethically the mother had ruled over them so they weren't being uh, 
euthanized for our specific teaching, but they died from natural causes. And we were able, able to do simulations where we thought about the decision process about how we initiated um, our life-saving bundle and whether we would do a thoracotomy, um, and then also able to actually practice a skill as well. It's important to remember that these issues do not come without fallout. And John Hines was an amazing consultant who worked in the north of Ireland, um, doing a huge amount of pre-hospital medicine. And he has an excellent talk on crack the chest, get crucified, based on an actual case he encountered in one of our local hospitals. So the majority of patients, if you undertake this procedure, will die. And there's no way around that. So you have to be able to essentially have your department set up that this is something we're going to do and something to intervene. And that if you could fall back either from one of the specialties or hospital management, you're able to back that up. So let's bring this all to a summary. So the first one is prepare. And for me, for this presentation, I should have probably had the presentation uploaded and prepared a little bit better, um, which is something I'll reflect on. But for your team for trauma, think about how you're going to prepare and set up and plan for those worst case scenarios. If the patient is arriving in your department in traumatic cardiac arrest and you've never simulated or thought about it, you're already on the back foot. And it's really important to look after yourself and your department as a whole. These cases are not only traumatic for the parents and for obviously the, the children involved, but as a department, they can have a toll um, on how we how we work. So do look after yourselves. So we'll bring that to an end uh, and I'll open up to any questions. And thank you for listening. You know, if so, I suppose I'd like to just say, uh, Stephen, around management of, of trauma, and, and we've talked a little bit about it, but in terms of the, the um, importance of, a trauma team um we, we locally obviously have had a lot of difficulties trying to to get that set up and to needs the right funding needs the right people on board and um, what about in terms of evidence for um use of trauma teams and outcomes is there anything out there that you're aware of uh, with in terms of to a specific trauma team and whether that leads to, you know definite improved outcomes it's probably lacking it and uh trauma team will improve outcomes but what i can say is having taught in trauma courses and um, having a team that knows their roles so the first day of etc you put a team together and they don't actually know how to do it they don't know how to interact and by the end of it they're running like a really slick well-oiled team with excellent communication so you're able to see that if you're able to have a team they're trained up they know what they're doing it makes the resuscitation run smoother in terms of outcomes if you're looking for mortality um, I don't think there is any studies which look at having a specific trauma team versus an ad hoc one out there, but I'm happy to be corrected on that.